so joining me today are four CIOs and from pretty different organizations, so I'm, I'm excited. We have had a few different calls and emails preparing for this panel, and I'm really excited to hear what everybody has to say. Um, I'm going to run down names real quick. Reiner Fuchs is the recently former CIO of Harvard Medical School. Andrea Norris is CIO of NIH. Bill Mayo is CIO of The Broad, and Artie Shaw is CIO of Eli Lilly. So thank you for being here. Um, to get started, I'm going to let you give a quick introduction of what CIO means at your organization and who your audience is. Ryan, you can start. Sure. Okay. So I'm Rhonda Fuchs, and as Allison just said, uh, I'm the former CIO of Harvard Medical School. I'm the third week of my retirement. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so. so to go back to a comment Jason made, you know, when I was 40, which was in 2000, Somebody told me the same thing. When I'm retired, I shouldn't have to worry about diseases anymore. <laughs> so I think we should discuss kind of what went wrong, wrong along the way. Yeah. Right. Maybe I retired too early. Yeah. So um, uh, when I was at, um, uh, at Harvard, um, my, my, the scope of responsibilities included research, education, and of course the administrative systems of the school. Um, I think uh, probably the one thing that kept me up most at night was worrying about information security in, a, in an environment which is by design very open, open and inviting, wants to let the inside, outside world in. But at the same time, we have to find ways to protect our intellectual assets and keep the school safe. So that's pretty much. All right. Yeah. Andrea? Hi, um, Andrea Norris. I'm the Chief Information Officer at the National Institutes of Health, uh, the premier biomedical research uh, agency in the federal government. Um, I'm also the director for the Center for Information Technology. For those of you who know NIH's structure, there are 27 institutes and centers uh, focused typically on particular areas of uh, research uh, or disease. Um, I am one of the, uh, head up one of the 27 institutes, so I also deliver uh, IT, uh, large IT technology services for NIH. So the, the communities that I support are um, uh, all of our 200,000 uh, researchers and 2,500 uh, medical centers and academic institutions around the world uh, who are partners and collaborators with us in biomedical research. Uh, we also have about 40,000 people on our campus in Bethesda, uh, and so uh, they are uh, uh, about 8,000, 7,000 of those are researchers conducting research. The rest are helping to support distribution of our funds for the research that's conducted around the world. So as CIO, I do more of the strategy, planning, uh, and uh, large uh, programs. Uh, and as the CIT, I deliver day in, day out services. So it's always, uh, including security, so it's always, uh, every day is interesting. <laughs> So good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Bill Mayo, CIO at the Broad Institute here in Cambridge. Um, and a little overwhelmed to be sitting here today. Uh, this is my second show. I don't get to tell stories of how long ago I first came across this world. <laughs> and it was shortly after the last one that Allison reached out and said, hey, would you be willing to speak next year? And somehow it turned into this. So anyways, <laughs> um, thank you for being here today. Um, some of you may know the Broad Institute of the story. I don't get to use some of the big numbers. Andrea was just getting to use, but we talk about 4,000 Brodies, maybe 1,000 or so of them are actual employees there. Um, I lead a team of about 60 IT professionals. We cover everything from the high performance compute to information security, business systems, service desk, uh, scientific computing, kind of that, that normal realm of, of activity. Um, and I like to say we spend all our time worrying about scalability, sustainability, and agility. So we'll see how many times I can work those into the yeah. program today. <laughs> uh, 
so good morning. Uh, I'm Aarti Shah, and Bill, this is my first bio IT. Yeah. Okay, so oh, you are way senior. Uh, so I'm, like, I'm like being a pro. <laughs> yes. um, and, and I'm I'm probably the outlier. I'm new uh, to bio IT as well as to the IT world. I come from the data and analytics world. Um, I, I'm a statistician by training. Have been at Lilly for 23 years uh, in a variety of different roles. So from a business role, from a research perspective, and now um, heading IT. Um, in terms of who are audiences and um, you know what the role of the CIO uh, coming into this role, you know uh, the depth, the breadth, the extens the extensiveness of what information and technology does. It's woven into the fabric of the entire enterprise. Means at Lilly, right? For any pharma, uh, our our work is so noble. Means it's basically we discover medicines, we develop medicines, we make medicines, and we sell medicines. And across the entire enterprise, IT is the foundation on which everything resonates. So my stakeholders are absolutely the executive committee, the entire organization from a leadership perspective. And uh, as an information technology organization, our goal, our job is really to lead Lilly uh, through this, what I call the cognitive era, the digital era, uh, to make Lilly's mission and vision come alive, you know, to make medicines to help people live longer, happier, healthier lives. So that's what it is. Uh, Organization-wise, uh, we are an organization of um, 1,500 internally and uh, externally have several thousand people uh, that work with our strategic partners for us. Awesome, great. So um, some of these questions were prompted um, during our conversation and Reiner, because he is recently retired, prompted some of the best ones. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the, next time one, <laughs> <laughs> the next one, he, um, you suggested that we discuss why our users are mad at us. So what are your users? <laughs> <laughs> I have no users. No one's mad at me. Um, <laughs> why are your users unhappy with you? You also have no users Because now. we're <laughs> stumbling blocks, right? Or at least perceived stumbling blocks, you know, for what they want to do. And sometimes, you know, I felt my job title shouldn't have been CIO, but more like chief juggler. <laughs> because life felt like a continuous juggling act of, of competing demands, where on, on the one hand, you know, you want to enable our, we want to enable our user communities to be as efficient, you know, as they can be, as productive as they can be. But we have to balance it, right? Because we have to secure systems, we have to ensure um, resilience, um, scalability, and so on. And we have to pay for it at the mm -hmm. end of the day, right? And I think, so one, I feel one of the, 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 the big sort of driving forces in our user community that makes our life harder, but also more exciting is, um, you know, people use the buzzword consumerization of IT, mm -hmm. but it's a very real thing. You know, our experience in computing is defined by interacting with you know, websites like Facebook and Google and so on. So what you're experiencing is kind of almost like unlimited scalability, um, continuous uptime, incredible speed. You know? well, people come to work and expect the same thing. <laughs> right? And truth is, I can deliver it if you write me some really big checks. Mm -hmm. right? But the community is also used to not paying for anything. Right? And that makes it kind of hard. So I think what makes people mad is really that they see what's possible, but really for us, it's very hard to deliver that in a way that kind of matches people's expectations. Right. Hmm. Anybody else? Andrew? Um, I, I would say the pace of change, I agree completely, this trying to balance. Um, so over the last few years at NIH, we've really benefited from leadership who saw the uh, the coming tidal wave of big data and the challenges that was going to introduce and knew uh, that our computational infrastructure was not going to be able to support that. And so we have invested heavily over just the last four years or so, five years since I've been there, um, in a 100 gig large wide area network distributed um, to 110, 120 labs and facilities, uh, a high performance computing capability that's now rated number 156 in the world. It's used by every uh, uh, one out of every four of our researchers. Um, a uh, collaboration environment, unified, that supports uh, thousands of conferences and video uh, uh, events. 
uh, every month that we didn't even, we had nothing like that uh, just three years ago. Uh, and movement to the cloud for uh, many of our kinds of routine data sharing and office kinds of capabilities. That's a lot of change mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, in many of our organizations, people were still using the flip you know, flip cell phone. <laughs> um, and so we had people from the most aggressive and proactive that want to adopt that to the most resistant uh, because they really could not see uh, as much benefit. And so trying to balance that, how do you, what's that sweet spot of uh, moving, helping to posture and move the organization forward at a pace that the, the entirety of the organization can accommodate. That is a tough challenge. And uh, also to your point is it's not magic. We make it look like magic, but it's not. When you pull that curtain you know, open and peek behind, it's pretty messy. Uh, and uh, that's true everywhere. And so um, I think those are, it, 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 it's not, it's not as seamless as it looks. We make it look pretty seamless, but it's not. And just tying that reality to the advances that we're trying to make and the adoptions we're trying to encourage um, is, is quite a challenge sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. yeah, so scale is what I think most often trips us up. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean just scale in terms of kind of number of petabytes or core count or something like that. It's do our processes uh, scale to what we're trying to do? Do the skills we have, do our team scale? Does our budget scale? It's all the supporting infrastructure that goes around the stuff we actually call infrastructure um, that I think is where we often fall down on our ability to scale yeah. or Be most at danger of falling down. I Means I'll add just uh, maybe three brief points in addition to what uh, the panelist has already said. I Means the first is you know I see that the gap means why are our users upset or mad at us is this gap between user experience and expectation between personal tech and corporate tech is is different, right? There is a gap over there. I means think about what we use in a personal life, right? Touch and we get all the answers whether it's uh, your iPhone, whatever phone you use, or Siri, or anything, you, know, you get the answers Alexa. right away. When you come into work and you have to put in everything, your name, your age, your sex, your birth date, your social security <laughs> number, everything to get access, mm -hmm. uh, all the zillion things that you have to go through slows you down. The second piece, as you think about from a scientist perspective, and when I was on the other side, I felt that same frustration is over my two decades, means 23 years, means it always come back, comes back to data, data, and data. Access to data. Mm -hmm. uh, the massive reformatting that needs to be done before you can analyze data, the number of platform systems that the data is on, and then think about the different parts of the data. It means you know, the value is when you can integrate your research data, your preclinical data with clinical data, your commercial data, and that not being available means that poses significant problems. So our users are kind of, they want that. And the last piece, I think, to the basics of infrastructure, right? There is a whole behind the scenes work that has to be done, and everybody means if the basics are not working in the way it should work every day, uh, there's no question, there's not, they're, they're just upset about anything else from that point. <laughs> right, so that's granular. What, um, and y'all have given me some hints of this, but what are the big picture questions um, if everything was just working and you weren't putting out fires? What are the big picture things that maybe keep you up at night? I think Reiner already hmm. alluded a little bit to that, but. I'll jump in just yeah. to break the pattern of going forward <laughs> and over again. It's causing me a great deal of stress. Yeah. Sorry, um, so, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what, the, the what keeps you up at night? What, what's the big picture things we worry big about? Big picture things. The big picture things we worry about. Um, uh, Oddly for me, I'm going to say security, which doesn't really feel like it starts out as a big picture thing, and I don't really mean it in terms of am I worried about some hack or some virus or whatever. I mean there's this, so the broad we talk about being all about sharing. How can we share our data? How can we share, collaborate with other people, et cetera? And security is pitched right now as something that is in the way of that. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't really have the answer to this. I'd love to talk to someone who thinks they have a real clever way of kind of changing the security paradigm. But the notion that we need to lock down an increasingly difficult shell, we need to vet people more thoroughly, et cetera. We've got to get past that lockdown and get into understanding how people are trying to use data mm -hmm. as against, so control the use of data instead of controlling access to data. I think access is just a proxy for what we really care about, which is use. And how can we move that? Because I feel like that gets in the way of our primary goals of sharing and that kind of thing. So that's the big picture worry. So in addition to InfoSec, uh, three things that on the big picture thing keeps me up at night or I worry about, or we need to solve this, it's an opportunity, right? So we don't say it's a, a challenge, but it's an opportunity. An opportunity. Um, I would say one is talent. Uh, mm -hmm. Talent, talent, talent means, yes, we will need our chemists, our biologists, our pathologists, our crystallographers, all to kind of have a deeper knowledge in data scientists. How are we going to get the, the supply is going to be, means the demand is going to be significant. What are we going to do with the supply, right? So talent mm -hmm. is one. The second thing I would say is um, breakthrough disruptive innovation is on the verge to happen within life sciences and healthcare in particular. All other industries that I think about, uh, the breakthrough has happened within life sciences and healthcare that is about to happen. And it's, our, our ecosystem is very, very complex. Mm -hmm. So it's not a uh, change, but the opportunity. So as you think about non-traditional competitors, right? Like the Google, the Apple means coming in with literally tens of millions, billions of dollars, and they can pour that into healthcare. How is that going to disruptive versus also requiring the domain experience and expertise that we bring in uh, that together? And then the third piece is um, the internal view of I call, I, every time I don't say just IT, but information and technology within our enterprises and within our organizations. Uh, you know, coming from outside of IT and traditionally, right, a decade ago, or means even today, many people in, uh, in enterprises see IT as, you know, means even when I've got a new job, uh, you walk into the hallway and somebody would say, okay, now I know if my phone doesn't work or email doesn't work, who do I need to call? And I said, oh my Lord, you know, that just tells me the work that we need to get done as to what is the impression perspective of information technology, right? right? So within our enterprises and our companies, how do we kind of change that? What is our collective role going to be in terms of providing that leadership mm -hmm. within our organizations to say information technology is going to be foundational, it's going to be mission critical to achieve a company's overall mission and vision. So those are the three things I would yeah. say. So I, I'll add, I totally agree on the talent side. I think that's, uh, uh, I read something the other day that said, you know, for all the uh, needs that we have in the technology, data science, cyberspace, uh, there aren't enough people <laughs> going into these fields by any order of magnitude uh, to our demand. And, and that's a practical reality. We have got to start to look at some more creative ways to increase that supply of people. But um, I'll also speak to cybersecurity. Uh, I don't know how many of you were affected or involved mm -hmm. with Did the WannaCry, yeah. uh, which whoever uh, named that one, I give them full accolades. <laughs> Uh, it was you know late Friday afternoon, almost yeah. out the door, and here comes the word, and there were a lot of people that wanted to cry. Uh, the um, that uh, malware did so much damage globally; mm -hmm. uh, it was stunning, and how fast it moved was really <clears throat> stunning. And as um, and we're part of the federal government, so we have uh, we have to follow extraordinarily extensive cybersecurity rules and requirements, which are often passed on uh, to many of you. Um, and uh, what I will say is, I was really um, taken aback by the role the Department of Health and Human Service played in trying to not only work internally with CD CD. Um, CMS, CDC, the FDA, NIH, Indian Health Services, but also with the entirety of the health sector. So within um, you know minutes to a couple hours, we were on conference calls with governors uh, and state and local organizations and thousands of Medicaid and Medicare partners, uh, hospitals, universities, medical centers. 
um, to share what information we knew, to uh, provide information about what could be done, um, and the kind of ability and, ag uh, and agility to react and respond quickly, as you can imagine, varied tremendously uh, across that sector. And um, these kinds of things are going to happen more and more. And I think the, uh, the cyber, one of the things at NIH that uh, we were fortunate to have is we have spent a number of years trying to just really lock down our public facing sites. We have a no high vulnerability rule. Mm -hmm. And if you have one more than 30 days, you have 30 days to fix, it has to be taken off the network. Uh, and those are not fun calls to make, uh, but they do come off. Um, and so when this came out, we knew immediately where we were at risk. We knew immediately where we needed to pay our attention. Um, and within uh, just a few hours, we had everything um, protected that was still outside that boundary, mostly internal uh, kind of systems. And so that knowledge of your environment and where you are and what your defensive posture is, it, having that at the ready is very critical uh, when you have to respond so quickly. And um, striking the right balance between the openness and collaboration and your ability to protect your intellectual property and uh, the integrity of your information is really critical. And it's a, the bar moves. It's not, you know, whatever today's sweet spot is will look different tomorrow. And so um, how we can best keep up as a community uh, is, is uh, something that uh, I, keeps me up at night. Well, next time I want to go first again, because <laughs> I'm not sure what to say after all of this. Uh, there's actually maybe one more topic I want to touch on, and that is um, this balance between innovation and keeping the trains yeah. on time, right? And yeah. when we put together the budget for, so Harvard is on a June to July through June financial year, so as we put the last, the budget for 2018 together, we did the analysis, and. And my organization spent around maybe 3% on what I would call true innovation, mm -hmm. right? And the rest of the money is spent on either basic infrastructure or improving existing systems, make them, scale them up and stuff mm -hmm. like that, give them more functionality. And I don't think it's very, that's, that's healthy. I think it's gotta be ways to sort of engage in sort of more sort of innovation, in particular in light of you know, continuously growing demands for, 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 for technologies. And I think scalability is important, but I'm not sure that, scale, that scaling up existing systems is always the right answer. You have to explore new technologies. So I think one of the things that kept me up at night was to try, try, try to find ways to introduce innovation sort of under the cover of upgrading existing systems, you know, or sort of growing scale and find ways to work creatively with, you know, I'm sure some of the people in this room here um, that have new technologies and find ways to kind of kick the tires, uh, explore which of them, because, I mean, it's not a secret, but much of that stuff is not, actually not going to work, you know. Or am I going to scale to the level that we need to? So how can we sort of test these things you know, in such a way that we don't necessarily commit up front just to discover it was a big mistake? I like, I like the idea of having to kind of sneak in innovation, right? <laughs> because the, the, the reason there's this balance between innovative work and kind of keeping the lights on is essentially what we call technical debt. Right, there's a formula in there that is something about this minus technical debt equals innovation or something like that. And as long as technical debt is too big, innovation is too small. So yeah, if you can solve both by kind of slipping in something mm -hmm. new and cool while also shooting the old thing in, in one move, mm -hmm. like, well done. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually also an area in which you can really break down organizational boundaries, yeah. right? Because sometimes, you know, it's, IT here, the researchers over there, mm -hmm. right? And these are areas where sometimes researchers have a particular need, a particular interest in the new technologies. And instead of being like the, the IT organization of your grandfather, you know, that, mm -hmm. says, that says no to everything, right? That's a great opportunity yes. yeah. to actually partner, mm -hmm. right? And do something creatively with a small community of committed 
kind of entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs that are really willing to sort of put themselves on the, uh, on the edge here. Yeah, it means I absolutely agree, right? It means it's said that innovation happens at the cross-section of different disciplines, and we have to break down these barriers. It means we have to have um, IT and the business, you know, understand each other and speak the language and understand each other. But between the scientists, the analytics, the statisticians, the data scientists, the technologists, it means that has to come together. Uh, it's, it's a team play. Right. So what does that look like? Can you might give me an example of what that practically looks like? Do you have a meeting? Just, Do you have some conference calls? No, it's just one <laughs> example. I think I actually have a colleague here in the room who knows the topic a lot better than I do. But um, we, um, I mean, much of um, the scalability issues mm -hmm. uh, for us came from next-gen sequencing data. But what has emerged as a sort of a new kind of data recently is of image data. So if more and more sort of images can produce more and more quickly. How do you organize the data and manage it and so on? And so we had a couple of labs that were really sort of pushing the envelopes in that space. And so we worked with that lab and, a, um, and uh, another organization that, um, that has developed the, a platform called Omero for image management. Right, and so we sort of teamed up. We pooled resources, and we we, we just deployed the system to help those labs, mm -hmm. but with an eye towards the use of it for the broader community. Because for me, it was very clear that the community at large is going to adopt these technologies sooner than later, and we have to have some solutions for them. That was a great example for me of, for me, not totally committing up front. But at the same time, helping the lab get us ultimately technology that can benefit the rest of the organization. It means in terms of what does it um, look like and how we are organized means it's very, very important. It means we have our folks embedded with the business. It means they are scientists there. You'll be surprised sometimes, you know, and some of the scientists, some of the uh, IT folks are in here in audience. But um, if you don't know, you'll be surprised with the depth of the science that they can speak about mm -hmm. uh, with authority, and that is required. So we have people who are dedicated to research, to clinical development, to manufacturing, to commercial. So they build the relationships, speak the language, and they are part of those cross-functional teams to begin with. Mm -hmm. And as well as, yes, from an IT perspective, they are part of the bigger IT family. So we make sure that you know, we are doing things in a consistent way, in the most efficient and effective way too. But they have to be embedded with the business and speak the language of the business, know the business problems. What is the challenge that the business is trying to solve? Uh, because many times, Instead of you know, uh, being just order takers and saying this is a business, this is what they want us to do, if they understand the challenge better, many times uh, our folks can say you can get there faster, better, cheaper by doing this. Okay. So yeah. that is critical. Yeah, we, we've spent a lot of time of late kind of thinking exactly that. How do we embed? Now, in some respects, we get away a little easy. I don't have a commercial function. I don't have a manufacturing function. I don't have a supply chain I need to run. Yeah. Uh, I just got a research team, right? So I got a lot of researchers to worry about. Uh, but how can we take large portions of the IT team and get them truly embedded with it? Because almost everybody who's kind of working at the Broad is there because they somehow love the science. They're motivated by the mission. They're motivated by what goes on there. So let them get in and touch it and bring all their excitement and our unique expertise to help move it forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, um, uh, technology has literally changed the way we do biomedical research over the last um, decade or so, uh, beginning with the genomic uh, data. Uh, but uh, as you noted, imaging, electronic health record data, sensory data, embedded devices, um, and so how to, how to best tap into that information in ways we've never been able to. And so we wouldn't have many of the, uh, uh, we wouldn't have made many of the accomplishments. We wouldn't have been, it just wasn't possible until uh, technology, the price came down and our ability to then generate these massive amounts of data. And so, um, 
Steve Jobs, uh, the late Steve Jobs once said, the uh, innovation in the 21st century will come at the intersection of technology and biology. And I think that's really what we're, we're experiencing and what we're seeing. And uh, one of our big programs that uh, we, uh, in fact, we're supposed to launch this week is, it's called All of Us. It's our big precision medicine initiative. And that could not have occurred without the intersection and collaboration of technology and researchers. So it's a, a multi-year, decadal cohort, million cohort study of collecting patients, participants, we actually use the term participant as opposed to patient, engaging participants in um, this study to contribute your genomic data, your phenotypic data, your electronic health record data, uh, sensory data, mobile uh, watch data, et cetera, environmental data, uh, and it will all be housed and integrated in uh, common locations for both uh, uh, scientific researchers to do uh, research, but also citizen researchers. And um, watching that grow, how we've, we've had to form partnerships with health providing organizations, with HMOs, with um, a variety of academic institutions, going out into the communities and partnering with communities to get people to agree to participate and to contribute your data when you may not get any information back that is specific to you particularly in your situation. You'll get information about people like you and you like that, but the ability to now use that data, we're just at the beginnings of that, um, has come from the collaboration and partnerships across all of those um, perspectives with uh, really state-of-the-art technologists sitting right at that table to build that platform and environment that'll make that happen. You think about what we can do with virtual clinical trials when we ha you have that uh, amount of data across these different data domains and disciplines, uh, what we will be able to discover that we never could before uh, because of our ability to easily access and easily uh, conduct research. And the integration with pharma uh, then to get those therapeutics uh, to market very quickly. Uh, again, uh, collaboration and integration across the different disciplines. That is, that is our, that's our key to success uh, in all of these measures uh, because it's too big, it's too hard, it's too difficult, it's actually too disparate uh, to get, get as much value as we can if you try and go alone. So. All right, so we're going to open the floor up to questions um, here and in the overflow room. Do we have mics? Okay, we have roving mics. So if you have a question, um, we've got one down here. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mike Chandler with Gartner. Um, Bill, you mentioned something about technical debt and managing technical debt. So this is a question for the whole panel. As you think about the pace of innovation and kind of the, your forecast for the number of new innovations that are coming in that IT are going to have to support and how much faster a lot of these applications have to get rolled up pretty quickly. Um, how do you, what are you going to do differently in order to manage that technical debt? Are you forecasting that that's going to become a bigger issue or a smaller issue, let's say, three years from now? So I'll jump in since I apparently triggered it. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot to that question that's kind of buried in there, and I see forces working in both ways. Um, I was at a presentation recently, uh, Intel, Dell EMC sponsored thing, a little local community we get together and talk about this kind of stuff on a quarterly basis. And um, someone was speaking, and if you're in the room, I'm sorry for forgetting who you were and what you were speaking about, but um, someone was speaking and there was a slide up on the thing that showed I don't know, 120 logos or something on the slide. And it was intended to help us think through this environment. These are your primary storage plays. These are your secondary storage. This is going on with this, that, the other thing, trying to group them all. And the lesson I took from it was that choosing among them might be a little bit of a mugs game, right? Uh, I'm not sure I'm ever going to get that right. And I'm not <coughs> sure I'm going to get that right on what I'd call depreciation timelines. Right? So am I going to make decisions today out of that and then be right three years out? 
So it's probably clear where I'm heading as soon as I use the word depreciation, but there are different models for delivering capability available today. And cloud-based stuff is clearly, it's not just about scale again and all that kind of stuff. To me, it's about the ability to be wrong most of the time and still end up being right because uh, I can rapidly kind of switch between different solutions. And that, to me, feels a little bit like a key out of some of the technical debt problem. But I, I would maybe put a different sort of spin on this, what you just said. And that is, for me, a key issue is, is to think about your infrastructure in a more modular way, right? I think you can't commit to one technology platform because it's going to be obsolete anyway. Plus, it's probably not going to give you the same kind of flexibility you need that the user community expects from you. Um, for me, cloud is a part of it. But at least for me at this point, it's, I mean, I, I don't want to fall into the trap of not committing to cloud, because what does that mean? Right. You commit to, what, AWS? Now you're stuck in that environment, right? Um, I think it is, Fundamentally, for me, the idea, for me, the answer to your question at the end of the day is you actually don't commit to any particular platform, right? You try to build an environment in a way you can replace pieces, right? And to kind of maintain what already works well, but you replace pieces with new technology that take you to the next level. Means they are all means to an end, right? Uh, means that's not yeah. the end game. They're all means to an end. At the end of the day, which route do we need to take to get to the business outcomes uh, that we eventually want to have. I do believe that technical depth absolutely is important. Uh, the business doesn't need to know all the jargon and all that stuff. That is for us to kind of say bring, have the technical expertise, technical depth, so we have that credibility and we kind of bring, do things uh, without all the jargon and confusing it, but deliver on those business outcomes. Yeah, I would say two things that are becoming more important as we evaluate different technology choices. Ease of adoption and ease of operation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, we're looking at both very hard. So how hard is it to get people to adopt and, change and, and use to um, improve whatever it is they're doing and using that technology for? Because if it's really, really high, we'll look at it. Uh, it doesn't mean we won't do it, because uh, it could be a breakthrough kind of technology, and you just have to figure out different strategies to get over that hill. But Ease of adoption is important, because if it takes five years to get people to adopt something that took nine months to, to deploy, you know, your return is not so great. The other is ease of operation. You have to have the people who can help support it, whether it's cloud, on the ground, underground, it doesn't matter. If you don't have the skill set who can work with it when it inevitably falls apart at two o'clock in the morning, then um, you've, you, you, you haven't. You, you haven't gotten where you need to be. And so uh, irrespective of the technology, I think those are two key um, spectrum ends that we have to pay a lot of attention to. Yeah, just add one more ease to what you just said, ease, to ease of adoption, ease of um, operation, that's ease of sunsetting. Yes. Because again, I think you've got to be able to get real start. And, and one of the biggest headaches I had in my job at, at Harvard was we had a system that was 15 years old and much of our core sort of uh, learning management systems and stuff like that was all built on it. And I mean, we couldn't get rid of it. You couldn't kill yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, how uh, do we get yeah. out? How do we get off of this <laughs> legacy systems, right? <laughs> well, it means you, that it the, the seems like you have to wait until it are, collapses you know? under its own weight. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. We can't yeah. afford systems like And think that. about it from an information security perspective then, right? Ah, means, yeah, we have right. one it's user, terrible. one customer who loves that 15 years ago, 20 years of system that was built 15, 20 years ago and there's a piece of data that they want, how do you move out of legacy systems yeah. here, right? There's a line from an Eagles song <laughs> that always comes to mind for me. They yeah. stab it with their steely knives. <laughs> they just can't, can't kill, kill the beast. Kill the beast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. Ari. Thank okay. you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, uh, Ari Berman from BioTeam. Um, Where's the question coming from? Right here. I can't see. I can oh, sorry. Right That's OK. Not um, so uh, all of you represent a quite vast uh, distribution of organizations and the types of organizations that are represented by the life sciences and healthcare community, right? Um, <clears throat> and so I'm really, and each of you operates in a, in a, each of your organizations have to operate in quite different ways, right, uh, to, to accomplish your, your missions. And so 
Um, I, th I think what would be really interesting is to get each of your uh, perspectives on what's the next challenge to sort of overcome with uh, scientific computing to support our, uh, our scientific communities and sort of ease discovery. Where do you see sort of the next, uh, the next step there? So one of the things that we're, um, I'd say, struggling with and challenged by, but determined to uh, make a lot of progress in, is how to leverage commercial cloud platforms in a way to put these very, very, very large data sets that uh, we have funded, that have been curated largely. They are, uh, in most cases, documented and well-defined, have the right metadata, et cetera, et cetera, and make them findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable in an easy way, and have our researchers bring their compute to that environment easily what, uh, to either compute, bring their own algorithms, their own tools, uh, and then leave what's best uh, or leverage what has come before them uh, in an easy way. Um, and to have perhaps even collaboration space that we provide the framework for um, to allow people to connect in ways they perhaps could not have. Okay, so we're talking NIH spends at least $700 million a year uh, sustaining these data sets. Um, that's a rough estimate and probably off by 50, you know, I'd give it 50-50 as to how close we are on that. And we spend more than a billion on computational infrastructure on our campus. So this is, these are expensive investments in this data, but we really aren't able to harness the value of it. Yeah. So we, we really want to be able to work with industry and our academia, uh, uh, academic and industry partners um, to come up with more innovative ways to establish these kinds of common environments um, that support not just the expert researcher, but the less knowledgeable researcher in informatics and bioinformatics, et cetera. That's a, the whole spectrum. Um, and to make it open to people we don't even fund necessarily. Yeah. So that all sounds great, except we don't, we as a government entity, we don't want to favor any particular platform or any particular tool. Um, and it's just that even the simple things uh, like identity and access management, um, how to ensure interoperability across different platforms, uh, real interoperability. If I run my algorithm here and I run it there in that platform, I'll get the same results off of the same data. Very, very, very uh, steep challenges. Sounds simple, sounds doable. You go to any discussion with any product vendor and they'll tell you absolutely that can be done. Uh, but in practice, it can't. And so uh, we're going to be doing a lot of experimentation in that space. We think that's where um, the next discoveries, a lot of the next discoveries will come from. Uh, but it, I, again, it's, uh, it's, it's not even worrying about the next technology. It's how to really make the the today's technology and what's just around the corner, 12, 18 months, how to make it actually work for us uh, as opposed to kind of just do some transaction. This is the moving from the transaction to the value mm -hmm. argument. It means the interoperability is the far by far most the biggest, the biggest challenge I would say, right? With the advances in technology, we can do things that we couldn't do even a few years ago. Uh, the partnership between industry, academia, and let's not forget the regulators, okay? Uh, very, very important, uh, and how do we do it? Uh, the interoperability so that uh, it's agnostic to some of the platforms. Mm -hmm. Also today, once you buy a certain platform, then uh, are you then locked in into their entire stack of, right, whether it's from a data analytics stack? Why is that so? Um, means interoperability is the biggest challenge, I would say. Yeah, I, I'd argue that in today's science, if you're doing anything yourself, yeah. you're not thinking big enough. Right. Um, the scale has just pushed beyond what we can do. And we can, you know, we can throw huge amounts of money at all kinds of different, you know, mm -hmm. huge amounts of money at any one infrastructure. Right. Yours is divided mm -hmm. thousands of ways, right. kind of funding the same things over and over again. Right. How do we 
create collaborative platforms that really move. I'll make a pitch for FireCloud that, uh, that the road works heavily on, but it's exactly at that space. Right. And you think about it, it's trying to solve that problem. It's one whack at it, but that's the biggest thing we're facing nowadays. I want to come back to a comment that Andrea made in her remarks, and that is that technology has to support advanced users and less sophisticated mm -hmm. users. And I think that's something we sometimes tend to forget. Right. If I look at the user community, community in the Harvard environment, it's a really bimodal distribution in terms of skills and knowledge about information technology. Uh, some labs that are really, really sophisticated have significant bioinformatics and technology groups within the lab. But the vast majority of the user community wouldn't know what to do with data if they ran into it. Right? But they need to analyze it for the science. I mean, you can't do science today anymore without that, right? But they're not sophisticated. They, they don't understand how to use. We can create wonderful cloud-based solutions and other stuff. They don't know how to use them, right. right? So I think for us, one of the biggest investments at the med school was to, so to invest into research computing consultants that can translate scientific problems into technology workflows. And to get a little bit into the weeds, because, I, because to go back to your original question, so one of the most exciting kind of technologies for me right now is um, um, so the, the, the fact that we can take um, uh, these uh, deep learning technologies mm -hmm. now and apply them to our data sets, mm -hmm. right? And we've seen a just explosive growth of interest in that mm -hmm. at the med school over the last couple of years. At the same time, now compare that to sequence analysis. I mean, I know some people will kill me for that, but sequence analysis today is just boring. I mean, everybody <laughs> does. I mean, you run a bunch of scripts, and you know, it, it works, right? For the deep learning technologies, we're not there yet, right? Uh, how can we take that to the level where those users that are not technology experts, and they don't want to become technology right. experts, how can we give those tools to them to apply to the data in a meaningful way? I mean, it's very easy to apply an algorithm to data and get crap out, right? I mean, yeah. but yes. how do you do it in such a way that you get right. meaningful results at the end of the day? I feel that's a huge, huge problem for the community. It means we have coined the term uh, uh, AQ and DQ, means how do you increase the analytics quotient and the digital quotient of the enterprise, right? Because it, it is pretty much that. It means technology is not a rate limiting factor or barrier to do uh, to do some of the things that are possible today. But if people are just not knowledgeable or aware of how do you leverage technology to answer some of these questions, uh, we can talk about all the cool IT and all that stuff, but it doesn't matter till we increase, get them to a certain yes. level. Yep. Right. So we've got a couple questions. Deb has a couple questions for us. Can you give us one? Yes. Hi, Marsha Nazari from Boston University. Um, I'm very interested, given um, the avalanche of data to crunch, reaching the limits of Moore's Law, the deep learning initiatives, are any of you, at least strategically, looking at quantum computing? No. I'd, I'd say no, not strategically. It's one of those things that's kind of interesting and cool and probably too far on the horizon to have baked into a plan just yet. Same. Yeah. I would say. Dabbling, probably, not more than that. I love reading yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really cool. Deb, do you have a second one for us? Yes, we do. Hi, this is Gunjan Bharadwaj. I'm the CEO of Inoplexus. One question specifically for Aarti and Andrea. How do you differentiate the role of a chief digital officer from that of yours? Ooh. Uh. Um, I'll, t I'll try and take a stab at that, right? Means uh, chief digital officer, chief analytics officer, chief data officer, right? Means the question is, does one person or one discipline own that or not? Means uh, in particular for uh, at Lilly, you know, we first need to kind of get to a level playing field as to even defining digital. What does digital mean, right? Uh, digitization is not digital. Um, and as we think about all the different parts of our business, uh, the roles between marketing and our technology IT folks, uh, you know, that's blurring from a digital perspective. So um, I'm more looking at it as we need to work with the business 
in the different areas to define whatever the transformations are and what is the digital roadmap of achieving those business transformations. So uh, we don't per se uh, to date have a chief digital officer, uh, but there is a role of uh, information technology, the CIO to play, to help the company, to help the enterprise, to say what does that look like? And that's what I'm looking at working with several of the champions who are champions within this digital world. So whether it's the chief marketing officer, the chief medical officer, uh, some of the folks within research to say, how do we work through and what does that digital strategy for the company look like? Mm -hmm. So NIH doesn't have a chief digital officer uh, either. Um, I think what we have, have done, though, in the past several years is we created um, a similar role for uh, science data. Dr. Phil Bourne, who I believe has spoken here before, uh, was our first uh, head of that and laid an unbelievable framework for us to look at better ways for getting our arms and strategies around the growing scientific data. Um, the way, in any event, Patty Brennan, who's the director of the National Library of Medicine, is now um, our, uh, fulfilling that role. Um, but the, uh, the way we work in all things like this is um, in collaboration. I think that's the key, yeah. is we have various um, directed co committees and, and, and teams of people who put that lens on. But, uh, we always make sure that as the CIO, I am on those committees as the, uh, in this case, the science aid, they are on the uh, kind of more infrastructure and core capability um, uh, strategic governing boards. And so uh, to make sure we're always keeping those in sync and I, I, that's the way we execute it, uh, but there's many ways to do that. But I think the collaboration and partnership is the key. And I think, you know, you have to fit in within the ecosystem and the culture of your own yeah. company, right? Because if the CIO owns digital, then whatever the perception, <coughs> good, bad, ugly, right, of IT is there, that gets attached to it. If digital is owned by the marketing organization, right, yep. uh, then the scientists feel it's different, you know, it's the other side, the black side, white side, whichever way you want to call it. So, I, so the, it gets attached to whatever organization and the culture of that organization is versus truly digital as I see it is, it's permanent into every part of our organization and we really need to kind of take more of a strategic view of what those transformations company-wide that are there and what is the digital strategy that needs to be there underneath That's it. Yeah. So Mana has one for me. Yeah, so PJ Amini from Monsanto. So I'm gonna warn you, this is gonna be a culture and a finance question here. Uh, I heard the panel say it a couple of times in this room is kind of a testament to the idea that there's more intelligence outside of our organizations than we have within inherently. So as we move into a world where third party collaboration and solutions are gonna come in more, how are you guys handling a culture of not built here that may be within your organizations? And how are you handling that from a financial perspective of having more SaaS solutions in cloud computing versus your own servers? And, and how are you guys adapting? means I can speak for um, Lily and I think Lily for now over a decade you know we went from being what we used to call a FIPCO a fully integrated pharmaceutical company to a fully integrated network company and partnerships uh, strategic partnerships collaborations are a key part of the innovation based strategy so that's ingrained within the culture and we have many many partnerships uh, that we work through um, I'll tell you a second piece that, uh, you know, even being a role on the business side uh, and then coming into the functional role, uh, the outside in view is extremely important. And we value that because our strategic partnerships, uh, our, our suppliers, our vendors, they, since they work with so many clients, they bring in a different perspective and they have seen all the different problems that we may have not seen it and they, we value that outside in view. At the end of the day, within the company, there has to be a core set of expertise and experts who are scouting what's happening externally. There's just so much and needs to separate out really where there is gold in there versus weed off uh, the non-value added stuff because believe me, there is so, many, so much stuff out there, it's absolutely overwhelming. Yeah, I, I jump in and say, you know, from a cultural side, it, it's baked in for us. I yeah. forget if I used the numbers earlier. We're about 4,000 Brodies, only 1,000 or so are employees. So you do the math, the other 3,000 of them are 
employees of somewhere else, and they might teach at the local at Harvard or MIT. The they local might school. The local schools. The school they might the they might practice medicine at one of the Harvard teaching hospitals that we're closely affiliated with. Um, they may be founders or closely involved in a lot of the biotech and pharma around. Uh, we have deep relationships with lots of the tech companies that are in town. So we like that. That is our thing. So I'm not really into kind of changing uh, the culture or struggling with the culture in that regard. Um, the trick is to make them all work, though. Uh, you get into these deep collaborations, and so often it's easy to get kind of stuck in the negotiation mindset. And it's like, how am I going to make sure I win this? And I'll tie this all the way back to the sustainability and scalability. If you strike an agreement that is unsustainable, it's not going to sustain. <laughs> it's pretty much that straightforward. And then you're not really building partnerships and you're not achieving your own goals. So you got to think pretty strategically about how you make them work. We've got one down here and then uh, Deb, you're up. So when Jason did his little uh, over 40, under 40 poll at the beginning, I was a little scared. Mm -hmm. There aren't enough millennials, I guess, uh, involved in our industry. And so my question is, what are we going to do about attracting and retaining talent, the new wave of talent, that's going to help us through all of these transformations that we're talking about? I'm so glad you asked that. That was, yeah. that's on my list in case yeah. you all get quiet. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it's a tough one, right? Because uh, um, we, I mean, it, the situation reminds me a little bit of, um, I guess I'm dating myself here, but uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, maybe longer, 20 years ago, bioinformatics was the rare skill set that nobody could find. It was really hard to find good bioinformatics people. Um, but kind of at that time, we were competing so within the family, yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> no. Now this world has really, the, the competition landscape has changed Thanks. very much. Mm -hmm. We're now competing with the rest of the world mm -hmm. for skill sets like, um, um, DevOps, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, deep learning technologies, and so on. And uh, and there are a lot of um, organizations out there that have either very deep pockets; they can offer a lot of money. And uh, and I guess maybe for the companies here in this room, it's an easier thing to do. But for academic institutions like us, we don't offer stock options and stuff like that. Uh, so we can't compete just on 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 money, right? So. Uh, so we have to compete around mission. Right? What is it? Is it really? Are you more? I mean, do you get more gratification at the end of the day out of developing a new method that allows Amazon to sell you more stuff you don't need, mm -hmm. or can you help scientists develop the next drug, right? So, or find new insights into the biology, and, and maybe eventually cure cancer. Um, the other question, though, is how do you retain the talent, right? So once you have the right people on board, how do you keep them there, right? And we actually found that to be a tough problem as well. And uh, I think here the answer is probably, uh, one of the answers is probably you have to give people exciting things to work on, right? Mm -hmm. You can't ask them to do the same thing over and over again. And then, you know, nobody in this, to your point, the millennials today, they don't, they're not looking for a job for the rest of their lives, right. right? I mean, I had an employee who celebrated her 45th anniversary with Harvard. I don't think anybody today will ever get to that point anymore, right? I mean, that's not what people are looking for. They're looking for new changes, new opportunities, new challenges all the time. So you have to find ways to give them that opportunity. And I think the other thing is community. Yeah, I think we have an opportunity, in particular in academic environment, to form very strong sort of communities of practice, communities of interest, where you can keep people excited and engaged, not necessarily by throwing more money at them, but giving them opportunities to contribute to projects elsewhere in the organization through their knowledge and skills that make them feel valuable. I Meets this is a very, very significant challenge, uh, and I hope we as a country take this uh, very, very seriously and go much deeper to understand what are some of the root causes and where do we need to make a change, right? We do need uh, kids, K through 12, more going into STEM, right? It starts from there. Where are Where is the leakage? Where are we losing uh, kids not wanting to go into STEM uh, fields? And then when it get, they go through college and all that stuff, absolutely, you know, what is going to excite them, millennials, and then the generation 
uh, after that? Um, and how are we going to get them to go and continue into the fields of STEM? Uh, whether it's the hackathons, the internships, all the usual stuff, but how are we building some of the partnerships? I think uh, they are going to look at uh, the employee value proposition for them is going to be very different. And we are already, uh, it's challenged with these other companies, right? It means yes, industry has certain perks, but when you look at uh, the work styles of at Google and Amazon, all that stuff is very, very different. I was just lead, uh, reading an article yesterday, uh, the top companies and what they offer. It was one of the companies where they say, not only bring your dogs to work, but they had a parking place for the dogs and free treats for the dogs. It's like, wow, <laughs> what are they talking about here? Uh, but you said something very important, and I truly believe for us in life sciences, uh, the mission right, why we come to work uh, every day and what it is, that whole mission centered around the patient and making a difference in the life of somebody, making the difference in the field of medicine, in the, that is so crucial. And I think if we can rally, means that is an advantage that we have uh, than other industries, uh, uh, that rallying cry around the mission. And hopefully we'll be able to attract not only the millennials, but the generation even after them. And I'll add, NIH funds a tremendous amount of training uh, for biomedical research, MDs, um, clinical training fellowships. They say the average age at NIH when we get all of our summer fellows uh, drops by about 20 years <laughs> when they all, 10,000 of them show up on campus. Um, but uh, we, your tax dollars go uh, towards training our next generation of uh, uh, biologists and bioinformatics and researchers. Um, and it's, it's a responsibility we take very seriously and really focusing in on the diversity of that workforce uh, because I think you have to have really strong systemic programs and processes to assure that we are attracting um, truly the best uh, with a very diverse background uh, from, from many, many perspectives. Um, we have, our studies show that the average age of an uh, independent investigator right now, first time independent investigator is 42. Mm. Um, and so we are looking very hard at how to back that up and really be able to uh, get many more early investigators. Uh, in the in the queue and have some very focused programs on that because uh, again the the pace and need is, is too great uh, it, it does all come down to mission uh, we, if it, it's the it is that mission that uh, will attract people if, if when you're in uni certainly in university and federal structures um, and I think just that constant reminder of the impact you can have. Uh, in um, with some of the best people in the world is is what will help us as well. Deb, I hadn't forgotten you. Sorry, Reiner. No. Thank you. Okay. But we've got, um, I think, a follow up question, and so um, mm -hmm. come back. Crystal Mavros from Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, looking around, I just realized I might be the youngest person in this room. <laughs> so if anybody wants to talk about millennials in this field, I'm more than happy to talk later. <laughs> just look for the young girl with red hair. <laughs> but um, on that note, uh, the question that I had for all of you is, what do you see as being the biggest threat to biological information security currently? And do you foresee anything worse in the next five to 10 years? All right. We have another 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, I mean, let me dissect it a little bit into components, right? Because sometimes uh, on this panel earlier today, I, I heard comments like intellectual property protection. So on. for me, that's actually not that important. Because at the end of the day, we're going to publish our stuff anyway. Now, I'm oversimplifying here grossly, of course, right? But there are two other aspects of information security that are important. One, and they actually cost me a lot more headaches. Number one is. Um, um, the protection of data that is regulated by FERPA, FISMA, HIPAA, and similar rules. Mm -hmm. The other, like patient records, right? The other one is operational, um, the impact on operations, right? Uh, and I mean, to your point, ransomware, the great example, right? We're not going to release any uh, intellectual property, it's not going to affect, uh, it's not going to disclose uh, patient records, but people can't work anymore. Right. Over the last nine months or so, Harvard has been targeted explicitly by state-sponsored actors 
that, that broke into our systems, and they typically come from countries that are from continents with four letters, right? <laughs> so, and um, they're not interested in their intellectual property. Subtle. They're not even interested in social security numbers and identities and stuff like that. They're interested in spying on, um, yeah, like professors at uh, the Kennedy School because they're advising the US government and other governments, right? They're interested in that kind of stuff. They're interested in using us as a jump off point to other places that they can sort of, uh, penetrate. But I think the biggest challenge is ignorance, is ignorance in the user community, right? And I mean this actually in a positive way, it doesn't sound like that, but most of our scientists don't know anything about information security, they don't care very much. Most of our programmers couldn't write safe code if their life depends on it. It is, but the users, the individual people are the weakest link in the chain. I can throw technology at all of this stuff, but at the end of the day, most successful hacks in the history of information security were successful because somebody clicked on a link they shouldn't have clicked on, all right? It's very simple as that, right. right? And we've spent lots of money to beef up our information security posture through technologies. But I think the biggest bang for the buck comes from education. Yeah. And it's very simple, don't click on stuff, right? I mean, I... So um, security is the bane of my existence, I'm sure uh, that's a feeling likely shared here by our panelists. Um, we invest tremendous amounts of funds in security. And I actually don't, I, I don't think there's a, there's a new surprise uh, threat vector. I, I'm not so worried about that. Uh, I'm sure there will be. Uh, and we will react and respond appropriately and, and get the right protective measures in place. I, I can't, predict but so much in the future. I think the things that are hurting us are the basics, the, you know, the just fundamental basic security good practices that our organizations are really not paying that much attention to. You know, that is the uh, running antivirus, anti-malware, anti-anti-anti uh, software on everything, having the ability to know what is normal in your environment so you can see very quickly when it is abnormal. Mm -hmm. um, and basic intrusion detection, basic shutting down of uh, critical vulnerabilities and, and patches that need to be deployed, getting rid of obsolete equipment uh, that can't be protected anymore or isolating it, uh, it you know, in, in, uh, away from uh, where it can be harmed. Um, it's, not the, it's not the new sexy thing or new technology that is bringing organizations down. It's the fact that you didn't deploy a patch that you should have uh, months ago. And these are things that you don't run the, the tools against your code before you allow it to be placed on the, the you know, worldwide internet uh, for anyone to see. And so our world, uh, like yours, we are scanned and uh, we have 270,000 security events a month at NIH, right? Where we are, these are triggered of uh, different activities. And we have layers of technologies, but the thing that has made the biggest difference for us was paying attention to the basic security hygiene and holding firm on that. And it looks like a, a, an insurmountable hill, but five years ago, we had 90,000 critical high vulnerabilities on our public facing uh, sites. We have 2,000 plus. Today, we have zero. It took a long time to, to work our way through that, but I sleep a lot better at night knowing that. Now we have an internal network that does that has a different profile, but that's allowed to have a different profile, right? And so I think the most important thing is knowing where you are at risk. What are the things you're worried the most about protecting? For us, it's life and health safety, then it's patient data and our clinical center and other research data, then it's the integrity of our scientific data. 
and then uh, in our financial stewardship, and then our just operations, right? We know one, two, three, four, five, those are our priorities. And we put our attention uh, in our investments based on, uh, redirect them based on those priorities. And so I, I think it's the paying attention to the fundamentals. I can't, I can't, and I tell people this all the time, we can't, the only way I can protect, uh, assure we have no security issues is to bury, you know, we will do no science. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> the day you connect to the internet, you are at yeah. risk. Yep. And so that's just the reality of our world. You have to decide where you're at most risk and do the prudent things and, and make sure people understand that there will be issues, there will be attacks, don't, you know, there is no 100% guarantee and there's no silver bullet. And so you have to be prepared for that event because it will occur. Um, but you don't wanna do, you wanna make sure you're protecting, doing the basics and protecting the things that are most valuable to your organization. And I think that's where, if we did those two things, we would be in a lot better uh, proactive, uh, preemptive uh, shape. I got to, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. So I'll jump in and redirect your question a little bit. I don't actually think the biggest risk to progress in biomedicine is information security. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an important component, but to twist your question, um, I think the biggest risk to our environment is kind of ignorance or ignorance of what we're about, ignorance of what's possible, um, ignorance of what it takes to get it done right. I, I worry a great deal, I, you know, you look at the debates going on in the country right now, at least for those of us from the US, look at the debates going on in the country right now. You know, we look at a picture and we can't decide which one has more people in it. How are we gonna <laughs> decide, but, but without like the political, like how are we gonna decide what the right way to deal with the ethics of the science that's gonna drive what Jason talks about. Like how, how are we going to have that debate? Because I think ignorance puts this progress at huge risk. Um, and if we can't have those debates, we're not gonna get all this grown up process that we're all thinking and working on right now. And so, sorry for twisting your question, but. I'm just going to add one more thing. Damn liberal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to add one more thing, right? I mean, so all companies are investing significantly in information security, uh, upping the education in terms of what does cyber hygiene and all that stuff mean. The one thing that I worry about as we move into the world of integrated care and connected care, right? And if something's happened over there, it means that goes yeah, directly to point. patient safety and lives. Yeah. Think about that. Um, and as we get more into AI and ML, all that stuff, if those algorithms, you know, if there's a way, to, if, if, if that's where the hacking starts, <coughs> needs to occur, there's much more. So I worry about the world of integrated care, connected care, because that's the next innovation in healthcare, which has tremendous benefit for the patient, tremendous, absolutely, that's the world we need to go to. Think about a kid with type one diabetes and having all of that automated, right? Means that is going to be a savior. Uh, but with that will come the risk and the exposures that we'll have to worry about and safeguard against them. All right, Deb. Okay, thank you. Stan Gloss from BioTeam. No, Deb, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Wallace, Boston Biomedical. Uh, perhaps you've seen a researcher who sees a bright, shiny new capability and a credit card comes out of the wallet, <laughs> and before you know it, you've got a research team that is using something that is outside of the technology purview, getting back to InfoSec, maybe there's not as much understanding as to why they need to worry about it. And in a world where um, innovation budgets and technology often are 10% or well less of the overall budgets, I just wonder, do you have any particular approaches or frameworks to both bring those individuals and what they're doing into a broader framework and any suggestions for how from an approach perspective you can get more proactive so that those things can be brought in from the beginning instead of coming in from the side? Great question. I would say it never happens, right? <laughs> it yeah, happens, yeah. Yeah, no, it no, happens no. all the time. And it is hard, because I'll tell you, for uh, any big, large corporation, it's hard to understand 
that whole spectrum. And not only scientists, I have marketeers or those, right, the next shiny, sexy things that they look at, they want to run to it, or before we know it, it's implemented. And then uh, there's an exposure as well as, you know, there's, there's an additional system platform that we have to take care of. The way we try to approach it is uh, we have um, leaders for each of the key businesses, and one of the expectation, one of the roles uh, responsibility is to kind of manage um, and have uh, some governances to make sure that before we make those investments to catch that. Second piece is procurement also helps us because we work very closely with procurement because they would have to go through procurement to procure some of those services. We try our best, uh, but I'm not, I'm not here and saying that yes, we have control uh, of everything that goes on, uh, but we are getting there. Uh, that's I've, what I'll say. I've been doing, working this industry, not, not the biotech side, but the IT side for 30 years yes. now. Um, yeah, 30 years. Um, 30 years now. And we've been in this conversation for 30 years. Like, yes. how do we get yeah. closer to the business? How do we stop the, the kind of off the program purchase, mm -hmm. et cetera? My, my argument at this point, maybe I'm just getting tired or whatever, yeah. is embrace it. Um, it's going to happen. Be <laughs> agile. You know, put all the things Artie talks about in terms of kind of making sure you minimize what you can, but really embrace what's there. Because if your answer once it happens is to be more difficult and more complain and mm -hmm. throw a fit and make them do this and get in their way, it's only going to happen more often because you're driving them away. So focus more on yourself, how to be nimble, how to be agile, how to adapt, and how to partner. Yeah, I would I would say the we I mean our, our, my objective is to support the mission. So if somebody has a need, you want to make you want to try and help make that happen. Uh, and there's lots of ways to skin that cat, right? And so um, uh, it, it, we try to have very broad policies, but we have a minimal set of foundational things that must be met, and we monitor that carefully. One of the things we did this uh, last year is we generate these monthly reports that show exactly for our big organizations where they are, um, and those now go to the most senior leaders uh, in the organization. That has changed the conversation, right? Because no one wants to be part of the organization that creates a, you know, a public security issue. And so when you see your organization and reds all over the paper, uh, they start having the right conversations with their own staff. And that has made a, a big difference, just getting the awareness uh, uh, up and, and getting it up at the right level in the organization. Um, but again, we try, you, you can't stop it. You don't want to stop it in many cases. Uh, if we, we want to try to make it work, uh, we, and that requires maybe a little bit of accommodation here and there, but, um, but there's, that, that's got to be your driver. It's got to be about the mission and then how to do the most appropriate secure security that you can with that mission first. It's not security first. We have one more from the overflow room, Deb? Yes, we do. Hi, uh, this is Dr. Ron Rybitsky, R&D Rybitsky. A uh, question to all the panelists. What's uh, the role semantic har harmonization plays in your IT environment today, and how do you see trending uh, for the next few years? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't catch you, the very beginning. I'm sorry, we didn't get that. Semantic harmonization across the so many different data streams and types, and uh, one of the CIO panelists mentioned you know, 120 logos on one of the slides. <laughs> yeah, so, so that, was, that was my point on the 120 logos on the slide. Um, I'm not 100% sure what to do with the question, though. Um, is, it, is it really about how do we think about setting direction? Is that kind of where you're going with? How, how do you solve the, the meaning and ambiguity of data that comes across to you from so many different streams ah, ah, so this about is about the same patients, so the same uh, disease conditions, same treatments. They come in so many different forms, packages, ways. How do you solve that? So at, at the heart, what I think I'm hearing is, is um, not to oversimplify it, but a, a data curation, a data management, a metadata, just a, mm -hmm. how do you deal with the fact that, that, um, that the, the, the need to drive studies, et cetera, are 
largely driven by size of data sets. The way you solve that problem is by getting multiple different people inputting to that. And in the end, you end up actually, is that something yesterday morning, uh, we were talking about this exact thing and somebody said, yeah, they put together a bunch of data sets and ended up with 14 different genders. Um, so, uh, okay, so if, if that's the problem, right? <laughs> if that's the problem you're on. Um, so again, I, I'm sorry, I hear so many of these questions with, with kind of a different twist. And on this one, I'm gonna go a different route a little bit too. I actually think the quest for perfectly clean data um, probably has the same problems as the quest for a perfectly controlled trial. Mm -hmm. um, that's just not the real world. Um, the real world doesn't have perfect situations with perfect drug adherence and perfect diet and perfect whatever that produces the real world result on a therapy that you saw in a trial any more than real world data has everything perfectly clean in it. I think we need to build models that embrace, um, clean up what's, what's like profoundly breaking the data, but sort of embrace the variety that's in the data. Figure out how to, how to use it and leverage it, and there may even be additional insight in that. So I hope, I hope that was close to your question. And community-driven, <laughs> community-driven standards and models. Um, kind of establish, as the, and that takes some time, and they, they vary from community to community. But I think kind of top-down approaches and complete bottom-up don't necessarily, they're either too hard or too long, right? And you want it more kind of at the community uh, level uh, and, and be prepared as those models and standards change uh, because something better will evolve in a, in a relatively short time. All right, Stan. Stan Gloss from Bioteam. Uh, with technology and data moving at an exponential rate, how do you keep your organizations current with, with the best practices out there? I mean, it's, I'm curious to understand tra with training or how do you, how do you do it? I actually see some of it through the same lens as some of the other questions, like how do, how do you manage technical debt? How do you manage this? We need to invest huge amounts in training right now. And how do you, you know, we all talk about the millennials and how do we attract the millennials and how do we give them a career that's interesting? It's actually the same answer everybody needs, right? It's constant learning, constant in curiosity, constant drive to figure out what you can do better. And we gotta find ways strategically to unencumber people so that they can actually move forward. Um, because I think more often than not, we have, by des not by design, but by accident, encumbered employees from going where they want to go as against wrestle with employees who don't want to learn and don't want to go forward in their career. So. Yeah. Yeah. Means it's all the means. I absolutely agree with what uh, Bill said. And in, uh, in addition, all the traditional stuff, right, means there's the internal training programs, the conferences. We uh, very much encourage means in terms of making sure that people are out in the conferences, uh, learning from that. You also need to make sure that there's learning that's happening within the organization. And you create a learning organization kind of mindset, right? You have people with 15, 20, 30, 35 years of experience. Uh, so that deep knowledge is there and you're bringing in campus hires, you're bringing in the millennials, all that stuff, and they're coming in with new ways of thinking, new ways of learning. As long as that curiosity is there and we don't stop learning, the dialogue between the them. There's also another big part that we invest from a people development perspective is business knowledge. It's very, very important that uh, they understand the business that they are working uh, and supporting, uh, right? So there's a depth of technical knowledge that you assume that will happen because of the their expertise, their background, but business knowledge is equally important, and then training in softer skills, uh, we combine that together. Well, we've been in a hiring freeze at the federal government since January 21st. Um, and so you really start to appreciate um, what is it that I need to do to help get my workforce, established workforce, um, able to deal with the challenges we're dealing with when there is a hiring freeze that may go on for months, if not years. Um, and so all of the things that have been mentioned, but I, I also, I think the, um, how to get some variety 
you know, people the, the, the doing the same, some people like doing the same thing all the time or like staying focused on particular problems. Most people don't. Most people want to be, have a, a little more change. Trying to find that balance is, is again, uh, can be often difficult. We bring in outside consultants and firms, uh, like many of you here in the room. Uh, the, the request I would have to you is to make sure before you leave that you are leaving a more knowledgeable workforce, a more knowledgeable team behind you. Uh, that transfer of expertise and knowledge uh, and how-tos is really important to us because at the end of the day, we're not gonna be able to keep bringing new teams in to help us with uh, whatever the next issue is. And so uh, that training and knowledge transfer, I think uh, is also important when you come in to work with our organizations as well. That's an important thing that we look to you to do as well. I think the correct answer to your question is send people to bio-IT world. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I think, actually I think training is overrated. Right? I guess what I mean by that is the flip side to the observation that was made a couple of times before that we have sort of this new generation of millennials and we have the STEM issue and so on. People that actually decide to go into these areas, I think are typically highly self-motivated. Yeah. I don't have to spend a lot of money on sending people to mm -hmm. training classes, right? In this day and age, you can go online, and you can mm -hmm. learn a lot of stuff, yeah. right? But you need to be self-motivated. And I think, I think it's key to, in your hiring, to look for people that are willing to learn new stuff and embrace new things and be sort of, to your point, willing to jump onto new things and do projects. For me, that has an implication that's very important. That is, if somebody shows an interest in a new area, a new technology, and so on, I think it's your job as a manager and supervisor to help them find areas to apply it. Mm -hmm. It's not so much to spend, write a check to send them to training, but they can do that online probably, but find a way to apply that new skill and hone it in practice. I think the other suggestion I have is, I'm just a huge fan of communities of practice. Mm -hmm. If you can create, if you can get people together with like-minded people, they will kind of train each other, right? And that is something that it's easy to set up, hard to keep alive, right? I think you can always get people together in a room and chat for a little bit and they have two or three meetings and then suddenly you have to worry about topics and so on. I still feel that it was one of those areas that I, I tried to convince my managers, my directors, they need to do this stuff. They have to find ways to create these communities of practice. But that also means that ways. each one of us, right, means curiosity is an mm -hmm. absolutely important skill and yeah. wanting to learn, always wanting to be a student uh, means I shared my uh, objectives for this year with my entire organization and I had on there increase my DQ, my digital quotient, right? You need to say what within that am I going to uh, do on means every year if you don't have a personal, we all have a personal, there's huge to-do list, and I ask people, what is your to-learn list, hmm. right? Make sure that you have a to-learn list, and are we as leaders role modeling that uh, for our organizations? And I would also add, we're paying a lot of attention to have the conversation of what is it the organization can provide you via tools, knowledge, resources, support, opportunities to help ensure your success. Um, and um, that's helping to change the conversation, mm -hmm. I think, and moving it in the right direction. Mm -hmm. We've got one more up here. Uh, Chris Connor at uh, eClinical Guru. Um, I like all the questions because they keep narrowing my question down to <laughs> something that could be a little bit too specific, but let's see. Um, so I've spent a career uh, leading high performance software development teams. The cloud is enabling everyone to be a developer now. And getting back to technical debt, I think the nature of technical debt is, is changing. It's becoming this sort of existential uh, you know, concept where people aren't agile developers. They don't understand the practices of software development necessarily, yet they're participating in the community. So my specific question is, do you see a role for uh, service lists and microservice directories as a way to create sort of app stores and ways for non-developers to get into the ecosystem while still you know providing that kind of uh, fertile ground for innovation 
I, I think absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's where the agile world leads. That's where the um, consumerization IT of IT is as much as anything else talking about. It's break, breaking problems down to manageable chunks and solve them that way and piece them together. So the API world kind of leads to that story. Like, yes. No. See, that's the beauty of us answering questions, too. Our answers are getting shorter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would maybe take a bit of an exception to the comment you made about the cloud enables everybody to be a developer. I think it, it makes it easier for developers to be developers, but it doesn't make it easier for somebody who's not a developer to develop. Um, a good one. Mm. I think so. That was a complicated statement. But uh, <laughs> uh, I guess my point is I... I go back to the comment I made earlier. Uh, if I look at the community that I used to serve, most of our users had very little interest in learning any of this stuff, right? So you have to take it to the iPhone, Android app level, right? And I think there's a technology, I think that technology that allow you to create like workflows and plug tools together I think that's where the opportunity sits, you know, where people don't really need to understand why it works and how it works, but they can put things together and make something new happen. Yeah. Ali, one quick question, good way to wrap up. Take uh, it away, Kevin. Co-founder prerogative. So this is, <laughs> I came back for a 15th anniversary party and we were having a very sort of sober, rather depressing conversation <laughs> about security and hiring freezes yeah. and all this sort of stuff. So I want to end by say, asking the panel, um, what, what are the most exciting innovations and tools and technologies that you see on the near horizon? What do you want to see from this crowd that's going to really make your clients, your partners work that more successful uh, in the next few years? Or to put it another way, what's going to lure Reiner out of retirement? Uh, that felt kind of personal, Reiner. It's an awesome question because I've just been sort of thinking about a lot, you know, what is it that could, me, could drag me back into like a full-time job? And I think, and I must admit, maybe I'm just jaded and old, you know, but uh, much of the technology I see today is sort of development of better mousetraps, right? Um, the one area that I'm just personally extremely excited about is actually, um, um, I mean, people use different words for it, but augmented reality, mixed reality, and things mm -hmm. like that, right? So the idea of being able to kind of overlay the real world with um, computer-generated information. I don't mean virtual reality, which I put personally yeah. more in the category of gaming, right? But uh, the, I mean, this, I mean, I have this vision, you know, of a um, medical student, you know, or just, let's say, a, a physician, you know, sitting in an office talking to you and in the classes, a person mm -hmm. can pull up sort mm -hmm. of your personal chart without having to go to the laptop and breaking the user-patient interaction. Yeah. And I think that's an area which I think is, I think there's some physical issues for making that all really happen. There's some computational <gasps> issues and understanding and mapping sort of the environment in which you work. But I just feel that is one of the most amazing areas for me. And I'm pretty sure that in less than 50 years, you know, we will all walk around. And, we, and there will not be one reality that's going to be a, re, a physical reality and, and a digital reality overlaid. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the, the virtual, the um, immersive nature of technology and the personalization in that space, not personalization, I can say I only want this to go off on Mondays and Wednesdays, but personalization truly to everything about me and health and my health, I think is uh, fascinating. Uh, and I, I, it, it's hard almost to imagine. We're, we, are, um, we have a big program to, uh, called the Brain Initiative, where we are literally gonna map the human brain as we did the human genome. Uh, with and couldn't do it without the technology we have today. Can't imagine what we're going to be able to do as we complete that work and learn from that. And I look at over the last 20 years, um, because of uh, research and other factors, we've reduced uh, heart uh, death, uh, 
death by cardiac uh, issues by 36%. Cancer is reduced by 1% every year. And in fact, now we're able to do precision treatments for certain kinds of lung cancers uh, based on the, uh, the work that's been done to date and the therapeutics. Um, we're gonna see, I think we'll live to see a uh, AIDS-free generation. Uh, and so these are the kinds of things that, um, if you think about how fast, 20 years is not that long to see those kinds of uh, issues and the, all the chronic disease issues, uh, the, we, those are the things that are, are literally killing us. Uh, uh, your, your, your family, your friends, and our financial situation is because largely because of chronic diseases. And so when we can move that fast and have that kind of impact over the last 20 years, um, you know, the internet was created when my son was born. Uh, and so uh, I look at what's happened in that last uh, 20, 25 years with the technology and the power of the capabilities we have today and what you can kind of just see over the edge. It, you can only imagine what will happen in the next 20. Uh, and that's, uh, that's my children and my grandchildren's lives. And so uh, I, I, I think it's gonna be unbelievably exciting. I, I think it's hard to predict right now, uh, but I think we'll move uh, in ways that the way people have their health care and view their health and manage their health uh, will be very different in 20, 25 years. And it'll be a lot because of the things that you're bringing uh, to bear to that challenge. Yeah, I mean, I'll echo that point. It's what, it's what we're all doing here, right? Yep. We referred earlier to how innovation happens at the intersection of different disciplines. The intersection of medicine and technology and science and all the different pieces that, that this room represents or these rooms uh, represent. It, like, why wouldn't you want to be here? Yes. Like, this, this is where it's happening. Absolutely means I am super excited about the future and somebody coming from outside of IT, okay, means people say that, you know, why are you more excited about IT than people in IT? I think the next <laughs> decade, 10, 20 years, we own it, you know. Are we up to the challenge? Uh, are we wanting to step up our leadership and lead our organizations, our firms, uh, through this cognitive digital era, as I will uh, say it, right? Means any part of the enterprise as I see it, whether we want to make uh, better medicines, better molecules, design of our molecules leads targets, uh, how do we kind of bring down the whole clinical development cycle time from a cost cycle time perspective, the interaction between the customer and customer just said very broadly over here, of course, the patient and everyone surrounding the patient that helps that patient to take that pill, right? Means it's beyond the pill, the products and services. Man, information and technology is the underpinning for all of these transformations, the big transformations that are going on within our company. Thank yeah. you. All right, well, thank you very much to our panel. Thanks to all of you for hanging in there with us. If you have more questions.